Well, thanks. Thanks so much for being here tonight. And, um, and it's such a pleasure to be here at a bookstore that uh, is such an important bookstore in the area and, and, and in, the, in the country. So um, can everyone hear me OK? Move this up a little bit. How about that? Is that better? OK. Um, Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Nuclear Shadow of Rocky Flats uh, is a book um, about uh, my childhood in Arvada, Colorado. I grew up in Arvada about uh, seven miles from the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant. Um, and actually, it, it, our first house was about seven miles away. And then uh, in 1969, we moved to a subdivision called Bridaldale, which was closer to the, to the plant, about three, three and a half miles away from Rocky Flats. Uh, my sisters and brother and I, we had an idyllic childhood in the sense that we had horses and dogs and we spent a lot of time outdoors riding our horses in the fields around the plant and uh, swimming in the lake. Um, and we never knew what went on at Rocky Flats. We had no idea what it really was. Um, and uh, we had no idea of the environmental contamination that was happening in the area. Uh, plutonium, americium, tritium, carbon tetrachloride, and a number of different things in the environment, and we had, we had no idea. Later, like uh, many kids in my neighborhood, uh, I worked at the plant myself and um, got a sense of what it was like to be on, on the inside of the plant. There was one evening when I came home uh, from working at Rocky Flats, and turned on the television, and there was a, a show on Nightline um, that uh, it was an expose of what was really happening at the plant. And it was the first time that I really had an awareness, that really had an understanding of what was happening at Rocky Flats and how um, extraordinary the contamination was. It was on that day uh, that I decided to quit my job at Rocky Flats, and the day that I quit was the day that I decided that I would write a book about it. Um, it took me about 10 years of research and writing um, to pull this story together. And I wanted to write a book that reads like a novel, um, but it's very heavily footnoted, and everything in the book is factual, so you can check in the back and see where, where the information comes from. But I wanted to write this story from the perspective of all, of all of the different kinds of people whose lives had been affected by Rocky Flats. Not just residents like uh, me and my family, but workers at Rocky Flats, um, some of the activists, uh, all the different people, thousands and thousands of people in Colorado and beyond who were affected by, by Rocky Flats. Another reason why I felt very passionate about this story is that there is, um, we are, we are we continue to deal with the legacy of our nuclear weapons production in this country in so many different ways. The environmental legacy and then also the cultural legacy uh, of how important this plant was and the way it uh, affected people, people who weren't aware um, of how they were being affected. When I worked at the plant, it was very common for workers to refer, to, we called ourselves Cold War warriors, those of us who, the people who worked right on the line. But for the people who grew up near Rocky Flats, um, we also were Cold War warriors. No one told us. We didn't know what was happening at the plant. The rumor in the neighborhood uh, was that uh, the plant was operated by Dow Chemical, and the rumor in the neighborhood was that they were making household cleaning supplies. My mother thought they were making scrubbing bubbles, uh, and it wasn't really apparent for quite a long time what was actually going on. And what's happened at Rocky Flats now is that there has been a cleanup, but a very controversial cleanup, um, with controversial levels of contamination remaining in the soil, and uh, 1,300 acres of that site are so profoundly contaminated that they can never, ever be open uh, for human habitation. And the rest of the site is slated to open as a national wildlife refuge uh, for um, hiking and biking and possibly even hunting. Um, so even though there's still a great deal of contamination on the site, and there's a lot of home building and shopping malls and highways and all sorts of things going on out there. So um, I felt that even though in Colorado and in the country as a whole, I think we would like to forget that Rocky Flats ever happened. It's a story that we would like to put in the past um, and pretend that it's all fixed and we don't have to deal with it anymore. But the truth of the matter is that it's a very important story that we will have to continue to deal with um, now into the future. Plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years. It's not going away anytime soon, <laughs> so it's something that we have to deal with. So what I'm going to do, uh, talk about this evening, I'm going to read um, briefly from three sections of the book. I'm going to um, begin with a childhood section. The way the book is written is my own story and then the, 
story and history of the plant itself woven together. And I want to give you just a little bit of a taste of those, of those two different storylines. This first section I'm going to read from is uh, from when I was a, a child, and it's um, the first time I rode out to Stanley Lake, the lake near our house, which even to the present day is contaminated with plutonium in the sediment of the lake, but we didn't know that at the time. The first time I ride Tonka out to Stanley Lake, the wind whips my hair across my face so hard it stings. Tonka is eager to run. I ride bareback with a single leather strap looped around his ears and a rawhide hackamore dropped across his nose, the reins taut, his head tucked and neck arched like a Roman perchon. He prances and dances. Let's run, let's run. He can gather himself into a ball of muscled energy and shoot across the field like a low rolling cannonball. I've learned to grip his sides with my thighs, crouch low over his neck, and hang on. Maximum contact, minimum control. I'm alone. That's the best part, to be alone with the horse and the gently rolling hills and the wind bending the tall prairie grass into long ripples of gold. I try to make Tonka walk calmly. My mother has repeated tales she's heard from neighbors about what happens to young riders whose galloping mounts step full speed into groundhog holes. A horse's leg can snap as easily as a slender tree branch, and there's no remedy but a bullet to the head. Like a minefield, the long grass hides hundreds and maybe thousands of potentially lethal mounds and bumps. How many death traps are beneath those dancing hooves? But Tonka dislikes caution. He knows there will come a time on each ride when we will be past the houses, the fences, the roads, and I'll drop the reins, bury my face in his mane, and let him rip. We sidestep through the metal gate and prance across the wooden bridge arching over the ditch. I try to maintain the illusion of control as long as I'm within range of the neighbor's kitchen windows. We pass the community barn, skitter through another gate, trot, trot past the long swamp, Tonka breaking into a light anticipatory sweat, and canter up a gentle rise to the barbed wire fence surrounding the lake. There is a gate loosely constructed of metal posts and wire. A heavy padlock hangs from the latch. A thoughtful child has neatly clipped the wires below the lock. I slide off, lead Tonka through, and swing back up. He can hardly contain himself. My vantage point is extraordinary. The lake stretches below us nearly a mile in diameter. Blue water extends in rows of gentle ripples to a thin line of barely visible cottonwoods on the far side. The wind dies to a whisper, and it's quiet, almost perfectly still, except for the snap of grasshoppers leaping from the weeds. To the west, the mountains rise suddenly, almost violently, from the sandy brown of the plains, layered silhouettes of blue and green and gray rising to a turquoise sky. My heart is filled with the beauty of it. Tonka will wait no longer. I pull in his head, tuck his nose to his chest, and twist my hands in his mane. Go, I shout, and when the rains drop, he shoots over the peak of the hill and down the other side, racing to the edge of the lake. His back is slick with sweat, and I barely keep my hold. There is mud. I can see it. Should I pull him up? Will he race right into the water? The ground blurs beneath his hooves. I see the body first. In the split second before Tonka spots it, I ready myself for his response. The sliding stop, the snort of astonishment, and the surge of fear. He knew I had seen it first. He spins around on his back haunches, and I pull him up short. The lower half of the cow's body lies in the water, soggy and swollen. The upper half extends long and rigid across the ground. Her head stretches up achingly, as if she had tried to pull herself out. The eyes bulge. Has the cow been shot? Drowned? Was she sick? There are no other cows in sight. I look again across the lake, cool, blue, and utterly empty. The mountains feel like a dark, heavy presence, a watching shadow. It's too far to yell for one of my sisters. I chastise myself fiercely for not having the courage to investigate. We gallop all the way home, Tonka's hooves ringing on the bumpy ground. So I think that was the day that I first had a sense that maybe something was not quite right. Um, Tonka, the first true love of my life, is one of the main characters in the book. <laughs> my Pinto Pony. Um, I'm going to skip up a little bit and talk about uh, 
this point where I actually went to, to work at the plant myself. The history of Rocky Flats is quite a dramatic history. In 1989, after years of um, avoiding environmental